having lunch with the MBAs after, so probably 1.15 or so. Fortunately, my slides are not opening for my start of the class test, so it's pretty easy. You got the sheet in front of you. You don't have it, don't worry, I'll read it to you because it's pretty simple. So let's, let's get started. Today we're going to talk about equity options. That's one of the issues we're going to examine. And I'm going to start with something that equity research analysts do almost routinely now and companies go along with it, which is they come up with the earnings, EBITDA, net income, whatever the earnings are, and then they will add back stock-based compensation. Whether it's options or restricted stock, they'll add it back to come up with an adjusted EBITDA. So you'll see with all the tech companies, the social media companies, they add back the expense. And, the, and we've kind of talked about this before, but I want to make sure we get it nailed down. The rationale they offer for adding it back is what? It's a non-cash expense. And technically, it looks like a non-cash expense, right? But is it? What's the rationale? For, for, in fact, if you're in an argument with an analyst says, we should add it back because it's a non-cash expense, what should your counter be? I'm sorry? Well, that makes that case even stronger, right? So, so you're agreeing with them that you should add it back. Huh? You're not agreeing with them, but the rationale you gave is an agreement. So if you're, this is the argument you use. Okay. So what's, the, what's your argument? Yep. In other words, if you all you done, did was skip a step, right? And here's why it's so dangerous to play this game. If I let you evade cash flows by using a barter system, you know what I mean by about, so instead of actually going through the process of paying cash, you just pay stock, you effectively can make your revenues into operating income, right? You could pay all your expenses with options and shares. So don't fall for that ploy. So the next time you see somebody adding back stock options or restricted stock, say, hey, this isn't a game. You can't give away slices of equity in the company and claim it's not a cash flow. It is a cash flow. 
from a discounted cash flow perspective, all expenses, even if they're paid for with shares, their employee expenses, have to be dealt with as cash outflows. So that's the first one. Let's move to the second. We're going to talk about, and this again we talked a little bit about, let's say you value a bank. You come up with a value of $12 per share using a dividend discount model, right? You take the present value of the dividends. The regulatory capital authorities have increased the regulatory capital needs. It's a big issue now because of risk and so what does that mean? You're going to have to go out and issue new equity. And many banks will continue to pay dividends while they're doing it, which is kind of a strange thing to do because you're issuing new equity and paying dividends at the same time. Tell me again how that's going to affect your dividend discount model valuation. Where is it going to show up, the fact that they've got to raise their capital? It can't, it, your current dividends still remain the same. So many people say, what, what difference does it make that Deutsche has to go out and raise equity? But what does it affect? It affects, but in a bank, there's not really capex. It's reinvestment, and the way it's going to show up. Remember the growth in earnings per share comes from your return in equity. We talked about this with Wells Fargo, which is if I raise the capital requirements, my return in equity almost instantaneously is going to drop because I need more equity to get those earnings, which means my growth is going to get lower. The same bank, after the capital requirements, will have lower growth, which means now value the bank, even though the dividends today might be the same, I'm going to end up with a lower value per share. One final question, this we'll come back to because it's, it's one that I think puzzles a lot of people. You take a young growth company, and some of you have young growth companies. You project out cash flows. Let's say you do free cash flow to the firm. It could be free cash flow to equity as well. Let's say you project out free cash Could your free cash flows in years one, two, three, four, et cetera, be negative? They can't, right? Because you have lots of growth, lots of reinvestment. So in a discounted cash flow model, you don't even notice it, right? It's negative numbers, big deal. But in practical terms, what does that mean when you have a negative free cash flow of a billion dollars in year one? What are you assuming the company is going to be able to do? Sorry? You can't get it back. It's actually out of the door. So you need to cover it, right? From where? Your operating cash flows are obviously not enough to cover it. That's why you have a negative cash flow. So what are you assuming the company is going to be able to do in your one? Raise capital. In what mix of debt and equity? You actually are telling me that. When you do your DC evaluation, there's a cost to capital, right? So if you have a 98% equity, 2% debt ratio, you're telling me that in year one, they're going to issue $980 million in new equity and $20 million in new debt. And here's where it gets interesting. What does it mean when you say $980 million? You're going to issue new shares, right? Will that not mean that your share count is going to go up? So in those first four years, when you have negative cash flows and you're issuing these shares to cover that, your share count is going to go up. That's dilution, right? You see where I'm going next? Once you get the value of equity for the company today, you have to divide by number of shares. In this company, what are you telling me? For the next four years, you're going to be issuing tens of thousands, maybe even millions of shares. When I divide the value of equity today, should I divide by the number of shares outstanding today, or should I also augment it by these new stock issues that I might have to make in year one, two, three, and four? What do you think? You think I should add it on? You know what nightmare you've created for yourself? Because to add it on, what do I have to then do? I have to estimate how many shares I will have to issue to get 980 million in year one. And to get how many shares, what do I need? I need a share price. You see the circular reasoning you've opened yourself up to? And here's the amazing thing in a DCF. You don't have to do it. And here's why you don't have to do it. Your, neg your negative cash flows in the first four years, let's say it's minus a billion, minus a billion, minus a billion, minus a billion. Is it affecting your value already that you have negative cash flows in the first four years? You take the present value of your cash flows, right? You've lowered the value of your equity by about 3.5 billion by having those negative cash flows. You know what the minus $3.5 billion effect is? That's the dilution effect already built into your value, which means that if you increase the number of shares to capture the same dilution, you're actually double counting. So one of the great things about running a young growth company is if you do it right, you don't have to worry about dilution in the future. So when I value Tesla, and I have negative cash flows the next eight years, I know they're going to issue shares, and I don't care. I don't care because my value is already being lowered by those expected negative cash flows, and I don't have to adjust for the number of shares as well. 
Because once I've adjusted the present value, I don't have to do it. That's one of the great things about doing a full-fledged DCF valuation as opposed to an earnings multiple in year 10. Because then you have to worry about number of shares and what will happen to dilution. It's already incorporated in there. So when we get to those companies, when I value an Amazon or a Tesla or a Twitter, you're going to see this play out. Just remember, when you see that negative cash flow, what it means for you as a business. And if you're a founder, entrepreneur, and you're projecting cash flows for your business, and you have negative cash flows, you know what it's telling you? <coughs> have capital lined up, ready to go, because you, you, it's telling you, the spreadsheet's saying that you need 100 million to grow. So it's actually giving you advance notice of, hey, be ready to raise capital, because if you don't, the game's over. So let's go back to the lecture notes. We were talking about the loose ends, right? We talked about cash. And what should we do with cash? Well, you can just add it on, but be careful, right? Especially with companies that have a bad history. Why? Because you're worried about what they can do with the cash. So you might have to discount the cash, and it's not going to be easy if you decide to go there. The second is cross holdings. In a perfect world, I said to value cross holdings, you'd like to value the parent company in each of the subs. You saw that with Yahoo. But in the world that we live in, you often have to make approximations. If you, take a, if you get a chance, go and look at the ABM Bev SAB Miller valuation I did yesterday. Because with SAB Miller, a big chunk of the value comes from two holdings. One is the joint venture in Miller course, where they give you some minimalist information. And the other is an associate. They give me no information at all. So I did my best. I made assumptions about growth and return on capital, but I'm kind of stretching there. But I worked with what I had. And then we talked about the other assets. The only rule I said there was make sure you don't double count. Double count in what sense? You cannot count an asset that generates cash flows in your discounted cash flow valuation twice. Once through the cash flows and once through the value of the asset. I was talking about real estate last session where you could be a company which owns some really valuable real estate where your headquarters building is. Let's say that's true. Let's say you have a building in New York that's yours. MetLife, that MetLife building. On, you know, the, the old Pan Am building is now the MetLife building. Let's say the real estate prices in New York have zoomed to the point that that building is now worth $2 billion. It's your headquarters building, but you say, I'd like to cash in on this $2 billion. Is there a way you can have your cake and eat it too? In other words, capture that high real estate value while still remaining in the building. A sale lease back. In fact, in the peak of the real estate boom, a lot of companies did this. What does it allow you to do? You sell the building for $2 billion, and then you lease it back. For this to work, though, the lease payments have to disconnect from the value of the real estate, which often does happen in booms, where the real estate value actually zooms, so the lease payments don't go up with it. So what you effectively do is you, you get the $2 billion in cash, and you replace it with lease commitments of let's say 50 million a year for the next 20 years, which might have a present value of only 400 million, and you capture that difference. So effectively what you're trying to do is say, that asset is being overpriced by the market, I'm gonna capture that difference, and be able to still run my headquarters from there. So look for creative solutions. Maybe that Mumbai example where I gave you the textile company, there might be a creative solution. Maybe you can find a space 30 miles outside Mumbai to put the textile plant in, and effectively move the plant over there and, said, and sell the land to get the maximum value you can. So that's other assets. Now let's move to the fourth loose end. Talked about difficult to value companies. And some of you are finding this with your companies. So I'm going to set this problem up by, by showing you two companies. And the two companies are going to look exactly the same in terms of the numbers. Same income, same tax rate, same return on capital, same growth rate, same cost of capital. Numbers look exactly the same, but here's where they're different. The first company is in a single business, has a simple holding structure, so you see exactly what they own, and has transparent accounting. Transparent accounting in what sense? You read the accounting statements, they're telling you exactly what they do. You understand what they're doing. The second company is in multiple businesses, has a very complex holding structure. They have special purpose entities, cross holdings, and they have opaque accounting. This is the kind of accounting statement where you read it and you have no idea what's going on. So the two companies look exactly the same in terms of numbers, 
but one is a simple company, the other is a complex company. This was the start of the class test last session, if you remember. And I asked you, which one did you pick? And I think most of you picked the simple company. And I said, I have a confession to make. In valuation, you open up my book, you put in the numbers, both companies will come out with exactly the same value because it's all about the numbers, right? Cash flows, growth rate, cost of capital, they're all the same. So there must be something we're missing in valuation, in traditional valuation, because instinctively, we, you know why we get away with what we do in valuation, which is to ignore this? We assume that what you don't know cannot hurt you. That's a very dangerous assumption. We assume what you don't know averages out. It's a diversification argument. You buy 100 complex companies. You don't know much about any of them. We assume that what you don't know cuts in both directions and averages out. The problem, though, is if you think about what you don't know about the second company, it's what managers have chosen not to tell you, right? And what do managers usually hold back, good news or bad news? How many accounting scandals have you woken up to where the company says, you know what, guys, we made four times more money than we told you we did. Notice how the surprise is always cut in one direction. In other words, what you don't know is more likely to contain bad news than good news, and that's why we're afraid of complex companies. It's not that we don't know, but that we worry that what we don't know is more likely to contain bad news than good news. I'll tell you when this came to the surface for me. So about 15 years ago, and Tyco had an accounting scandal. Uh, they, they were doing, doing acquisitions, they were hiding stuff, it eventually blew up, and they dropped 70% in value when the accounting scandal came out. That wasn't a surprise, you know, you, you cheat, it's going to be caught. You know, eventually you're going to get caught. But in the, in the weeks after the Tyco scandal, G lost 15% of its value. You say, why? What did GE and Tyco share in common? They were both conglomerates. They both grew through acquisitions. And what were investors saying? Well, Tyco used that process to hide a lot of bad stuff. So how do we know GE is not doing the same thing? Sounds incredibly unfair, but that's how investing works, right? You learn from your mistakes, and then you try to extrapolate. So it was during a valuation class. And I said, you know what? We've got to grapple with this more directly. We've got to come up with a way of bringing complexity into valuation. And to bring complexity into valuation, there are two things I need to do. The first is I need to measure complexity. It's not enough to say I'll know a complex company when I see it. We have to come up with a way of measuring complexity. The second is once you've measured the complexity, you've got to tell me a mechanism by which you bring it into value. So it was, I think, a Monday class that this issue came up. I said, no, we should do it. And I said, I'll, I'll come up with my first measure of complexity by Wednesday. And I came back with a table, and I have to tell you, even before I show you this table, that the people in the class were not impressed by my complexity measure. Here's what I did. I counted the number of pages <laughs> in the 10Q and the 10K. I know it's incredibly simplistic, but if you wanted to avoid a company to value in this group, which one would you avoid? Look at this. Look at Citigroup. One, that's like war and peace. 1,026 pages to tell me what happened last year. You're one screwed up company. As I said, the MBAs were not impressed. They said, we're not paying $200,000 to count pages. We want something more sophisticated. I said, you're right. I'll be back next Monday. And I came back with what I call my valuation shit list. It's a technical term. It's all the things that bug me when I value companies and how much they bug me. I may, I'm, I can convert almost anything into an Excel spreadsheet. When my daughter went to college, she was having trouble making decisions. She has trouble making decisions in general. She can't order food off the menu. Picking college was like a nightmare. I said, Kendra, I'll create an Excel spreadsheet for you. Tell me all the things you want. I'll create weights. I'll create a score. She ended up not using it. So this is my valuation bug list. So basically, the things that bug me in valuation, how much they bug me. So I'll give you a few examples. A company that claims to be geographically diversified but doesn't tell you where. What the heck is that supposed to mean? We're all over the globe, OK? Nice. But where exactly are you? No, we can't tell you that. Or they tell you where, but you don't recognize any of the parts of the world that they claim to be in. I'll give you an example. I was valuing BMW about 15 years ago. And they break their revenues down by region. So they have North America, South America, Europe. Oceania. I'm thinking, 
my geography class, what the heck is Oceania? Where is that? Is that the lost continent of Atlantis? What are they selling there? So I called the investment relations officer of BMW. He said, where's Oceania? They said, it's Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand. And I said, so why do you call them Oceania? He said, all by an ocean. <laughs> I said, really? OK. By that definition, 95% of the world is Oceania. What are you left with? A few landlocked countries like Latvia? Is Latvia landlocked? If it's not, you know, just take it off the list. Yeah. But do you see the problem you create for me when you combine Australia and Indonesia? Why do I need this geographical breakdown? To attach an equity risk premium, right? Australia has an equity risk premium of 6%. Indonesia has an equity risk premium of 11%. You combine them, which one am I going to attach? How do I know where you sell your cars? I would hope as BMW, you actually knew whether you were selling in Indonesia or Australia. And if you do, why the hell don't you tell me? I think this is one thing that really bugs me about companies. We've talked about this with companies that say, rest of the world. What the heck does that mean, rest of the world? Be more specific. So that bugs me. How much it bugs me, I put a weight in. Or a company whose effective tax rate zigzags every year from 31% to minus 15 to 126 to minus 63. You know what it's telling me? You have two sets of books. And you're letting me see just your reporting books. So I took everything that bugs me, how much it bugs me. I created an And the higher the score you get on this, the more complex the company. So I came back on Monday, and I said, do you like this? And they said, this is much better than the number of pages. This is why we came back to business school. I said, really? And each of you is valuing a company, right? Just like you guys were. They were way behind on the project, just like you were. <laughs> and I said, this semester, because to get this score for Citigroup, what do I need to do? I need to read 1,026 pages. And there's no way I'm doing it. But I said, hey, you guys have a company to value this semester, right? They could see the train coming at them down the tracks. It's too late to get out. They should have just stuck with the number of pages. I said, this semester, I'm going to add one more thing to your to-do list. In addition to valuing the company, why don't you come up with a complexity score? They bitched and they moaned but I had them at my mercy. So that semester, in addition to valuing the company, doing a DCF or relative value, they had to come up with a complexity score. And I learned some very interesting things. For instance, I found that there was no correlation between the complexity score and the size of a company. We tend to think of big companies as companies. It's amazing. You have some really small companies that are incredible messes to work with, and some really large companies that are easy to work with. Second, emerging market companies are about 20% more complex than developed market companies, usually because of holding structures. Not, not in accounting information problems, but holding structures, where these cross holdings kind of go into a mess. Companies that grow through acquisitions were about 25 to 30% more complex than companies that grow with internal investments. Those of you working with companies that grow through acquisitions are going to recognize this very quickly for two reasons. One is when you grow through acquisitions, it's lumpy. You can't look at one year. It's all over the place. And the second is the accounting debris created by acquisitions. You know what I'm talking about when I say accounting debris? Goodwill, amortization of goodwill, impairment of goodwill is a nightmare. And finally, any company with a capital arm is significantly more complex than a company without. You know what I'm talking about, GM, GMAC, Volkswagen, you, you know, you're saying, what's the problem? You take a bank, you put it right in the middle of a company, and say, trust us, we built a Chinese wall around the bank. How the heck do I know that the $150 billion you claim to have borrowed came through the bank? So companies that grow through acquisitions have a capital arm and multiple businesses, multiple countries are... You know what the most complex company that semester in my class was? Probably still is. If you were creating a nightmare for a person to value, that was my mission in life. You know what I'd create? I'd create GE. GE is your ultimate nightmare. This is my vision of hell. I show up in hell. The devil walks up to me. Why he's walking up to me, I don't know. He says, welcome to hell. Then he gets me valuing companies. One company over, it's like Groundhog Day, value GE over and over again for the rest of eternity. That's my vision of hell. And for those of you who are there, I don't want to join you, but you can still change your company. Right? 
But here's the interesting thing. The most transparent company, the least complex company that year, was actually an Indian company, Infosys. And the reason I bring that up is when I go into emerging markets, the excuse that CFOs and CEOs give for why their companies are opaque and complex is, we're in Indonesia, we cannot be transparent. The information disclosure laws here are not that strong. As if information disclosure laws put a ceiling on what you can reveal. They put a floor. You want to tell me more about your company, nothing stops you. So don't hide behind the fact that you're a Brazilian company, an Indonesian company, an Indian company. If you want to tell me about your company, nothing stops you from doing it. And here's my biggest fear. Every time accounting coughs, you know what I mean by accounting coughs, right? A new rule is added in accounting. My financial statements get more opaque. For the last 35 years, accountants have been trying to help me. And every time they try to help me, I said, please stop. It's actually more difficult to read a balance sheet now with fair value accounting and all that stuff that they've thrown in than it was 35 years ago. So that's complexity, and you can either measure with number of pages or with the complexity score, but clearly, that's the first stop. The second stop is how do I bring this into the valuation? And if you think from a discounted cash flow perspective, there are only four places you can go, right? You can try to lower the cash flows for complex companies. Heck, cut them. What does that mean if you have a complex company? You estimate the cash flows and you knock off 10%. Why 10%? I have no idea. That's the problem with hair cutting. It's almost arbitrary. The second is you can raise the discount rate for complex companies. And I'll give you at least a template for how this might be doable, even though it's not going to be easy. Remember I said a month of my sabbatical was on complexity? And as part of the month, I got to day 22. I was pretty much done. I said eight more days in the month. Might as well try something interesting. So what I did was I took the S&P 500 and I broke it up into two groups, complex and simple. Basically, in the simple group, I put in companies which are in a single business, you know, relatively easy 10Ks. And then I estimated, you know how we did the implied equity risk premium for the S&P 500? I did an implied cost of equity for the 250 complex companies and an implied cost of equity for the 250 simple companies. What am I trying to find there? whether the market's charging the same cost of equity. At, the, at least at the time that I did this, the difference was about 1%. Complex companies had a cost of equity 1% higher than simple companies. So what should you do? You take risk-free rate plus beta times equity risk premium, just like you do for any company, and then you add 1% if you have a complex company. The only problem is that 1% has to get updated constantly, and I've never had the energy to do it. So if you want to do it, you're welcome to take the S&P 500 and do it for yourself. But that's the second. So I've told you, haircutting the cash flows is difficult. Adjusting the discount rate is difficult. So I'll tell you my preferred route. Big driver of value is that return on capital, right? Basically, a company to create value has done a return on capital above the cost of capital. And you compute the return on capital using operating income, invested capital, et cetera. Let's say you come up with a return on capital of 18%. The cost of capital is 9%. That's good news, right? Your company's earning well above the cost of capital. It's going to create value. But then I ask you, why is your company making an 18% return on capital? What am I asking you? What, what's its business? What's its competitive advantage? And if you understand the company, you'll give me a reason. Amgen is able to earn a high return on capital because it gets patent protection. It's got these three blockbuster drugs. But if I ask you that question about your company, you say, I have no idea. What are you telling me? This company is so messy. I have no idea how they make money or why they make money. And if that is the case, how much can you trust that 18% to stay at its current level into the future? I don't see how you can even assume it can stay at 18% if you can't tell me why. So for complex companies, that is the mechanism I use as I take that 18% and I very quickly close it towards the 9 And as I close it, what happens to the value of growth? It goes away. I still remember the late 1990s. A lot of people in this class used to pick Enron to value it. At that time, a star company growing fast. And to a person, every person who valued Enron would come to me in the middle of the semester. This is before we knew about the accounting scandals and all the rest of the stuff. They said, this company makes a lot of money, but I have no idea what it does. It, what, what, what was Enron? What business was it in? Energy trading. What the heck does that even mean? I have no idea. What's your competitive advantage? I have no idea. 
And that's what these people say. I have no idea what they do or why they make money, but they make a heck of Turned out that they were making a lot of money because they had special purpose entities feeding an income. You didn't see that in the balance sheet. So I tell them, look, if you don't know how they're making money, then you can't assume they can keep doing it. So when you value the company, you've got to very quickly bring the return on capital down to the cost of capital. Almost instantaneously, you'd wipe out half the value of the company. So that's the first technique, is actually work through a discounted cash flow valuation. Here's the other one, and it's kind of a throwaway technique. So I got to about two days left in the 30, 30 days in the month, and so you know what? I have time to do one more thing on complexity. So I took the 100 largest market cap companies in the US. I took their price to book ratios. And I ran a regression, which is a pretty typical one. When we talk about relative valuation, we'll come to this regression of return in equity, beta, and growth, which are conventional variables you throw in to explain price to book. Companies with high return equity tend to have high price to book. But in this regression, I threw in a fourth variable, the number of pages in your 10K. Just, just to see what would happen. I got a coefficient of minus 0 0.003, and it was statistically significant. What does that tell me? When I, re when I look at that, what is it telling me? For every 100 additional pages in the 10K, what happens to my price to book ratio? It decreases by 0.3. So this is going to sound incredibly simplistic, but can I, what cities price to book right now? It's like 0.9. It's trading at less than book value. I have a very simple proposal to double its price to book. What should it do? Knock 300 pages off your 10K. Sounds very simplistic, but what am I telling Siri? Why, why is the 10K this bloated mess? It wasn't an accident. I can trace it back to the day in 1998 when John Reed and Sandy Waltz stood next to each other, travelers and Siri, and said, we're going to create the ultimate financial supermarket. We're going to be all things to all people. We're going to be bank. We're going to be insurance company. We're going to be investment bank. We're going to be everything. So what are we saying when you say knock 300 pages? We need focus. That if you're focused, you will end up with a. And I would make this suggestion to money center banks today. I think part of the reason money center banks traded below book value, and they do right now, and we'll see this when we do. And this is, and for the last few years they have, in spite of the return equity going up, is people have lost faith in being able to decipher what's going on. It's too com complex a mess. They're saying, I have no idea what's going on in there, so I'm going to discount it. So focus has a payoff, and that payoff shows up as a higher pricing. And of course, this varies across time. Every time there's a scandal, this is going to become a bigger issue. You have 10 years of a bull market, people tend to forget. So you go through ebbs and flows on how much the market values complexity at. Let's talk a little bit about debt. When we talked about debt in the context of cost of capital, I said, be narrow in your definition of debt. The only items that should be in debt are interest-bearing debt, short-term as well as long-term, bank debt, corporate bonds, and lease commitments. I said, Don't, be careful about carrying off into the rest of the stuff on the balance sheet, like underfunded pension obligations. Don't include them in debt. And part of you said, but I, I want to be conservative. The reason I said don't include them in debt is if you bring them into debt, what's going to happen to your debt ratio? It's going to go up. And if you're not careful, what's going to happen to your cost of capital? Counting everything in debt is going to make it 80% debt company. It's actually going to lower your cost of capital because the cost of debt is lower than. So if you want to be conservative, counting everything as debt is not going to do that for you. So anybody who uses underfunded pension obligations as part of debt will end up coming up with too low a cost of capital for the company. So I said for cost of capital, Trust me, stay with this narrow definition of debt. Let's say you've done that. You've come up with a value for the firm. Let's say the value that you get for the firm is a billion. The company has a billion dollars in debt outstanding in book value terms. But it's distressed. That debt is trading at half of book value. It's trading at 500 million. So I have a very simple question here. Let's say you come up with the value of the operating assets of a billion, and I'm asking you what the value of equity in the company is. I'll give you two answers, and you tell me which one is a better estimate of the value of your equity. In the first, I subtract out the book value of your debt. Billion minus a billion is zero. In the second one, I subtract out the market value of your debt, in which case your equity is worth the half a billion. Should I subtract out book debt or market debt? to get to equity. 
You see, so when we did cost of capital, it was a no-brainer. Always use market value of debt to get weights. Now you come up with the value of the firm. I'm saying, now I'm revisiting the debt. Should I subtract out book or market? You think book? I agree with you on this one. But I'll also tell you that almost every valuation book, including mine, says subtract out market value. And I'll tell you, so do you want to give me the backing for why it should it be a book? Well, if you're going to buy the whole company, why is it the In fact, let's play a game. Let's assume I'm an acquiring company. I acquire you. I'm a safe acquiring company. Why am I trading at half of book value? Because investors in these bonds think that the company might default, right? If I acquire you, what happens to that default risk? It's going to go. No, the default risk is going to go down. The bond price is going to go up. So I'm going to think I'm getting, a, I'm paying 500 million. I think I'm paying a fair price, market value of a, the firm minus market value of equity. I'm sorry, market value of debt. But the minute I finish the acquisition, the half a billion is going to go back to a billion. So when you have severely distressed companies, there's an argument to be made that you should be subtracting out book debt. This is going to be an issue only with severe distress. Most companies, you're going to be okay subtracting out market debt. But if you have a distressed company, that's something to watch out to for. And if you're doing a liquidation value, obviously you have to pay the book debt. Right? The bank doesn't say, oh, you just pay me half the debt and it's going to be OK. It's, it's possible, though, that if you have corporate bonds outstanding, that you might be able to find a clever banker to buy back those bonds at current market prices. But that's, I think, an issue you've got to examine. But that's the first issue. Is once you get to the value of the firm, whether you should subtract out book debt or market debt, you know, every book says to subtract out market debt, including mine, but there are exceptions, like this one, deeply distressed companies. Here's the second one. Remember when I did the debt for the cost of capital, I said, be narrow in your definition of debt. You have an underfunded pension obligation, I said, don't worry about it. Underfunded healthcare obligation, I said, don't worry about it. That sounds like a weird thing to say, right? If you are a company with $20 billion in underfunded pension obligations, you think, how can I not worry about it? I'm the equity investor. Here's why I told you not to worry about it in the cost of capital. Once you get the value of the firm, to get to value of equity, so now we're talking about the debt to subtract out, be broad in your definition of debt. The debt you subtract out doesn't have to be the same debt that you used in the cost of capital. So here, if you're valuing a legacy company with a huge underfunded pension obligation, you should subtract that out. You have unfunded, no, whatever that, that liability is that you see, you should be subtracting out. But I'll add to that. If your company is the target of a lawsuit of fines, and this is the Volkswagen problem, you're not quite done, right? Because to get to the value of the equity, what else do you need to do? You need to assess the likelihood that you will lose these lawsuits, how much you will have to pay and subtract them out, because this is your last chance to mop up as an equity investor. You can't come back and say, oh my god, I forgot that. Can you give me back $15 of my stock price? So if you get a chance, go back and look at the Volkswagen valuation, because I'm not subtracting out the $7.3 billion that they've set aside as a provision. Because that's just following accounting rules. I have to, as an investor, ask, what is that expected payout that I see from all of these diesel emission cheating scandals? And I have to make my best judgment here. And I'll tell you the biggest problem with doing this is to make this adjustment, especially if you're the target of a lawsuit. You've got to understand how the legal system works, and I'll make a confession. I have no idea how this damn thing works. Why? Because it's not just one lawsuit, whether you win or lose, right? There's an appeals process. That's why you can have a tobacco company where the initial lawsuit, you're found guilty and asked to pay $5 billion. By the time the appeals process is done, it's down to $50 million. Don't ask me how this happens over the process, but you need to be almost an expert in this process. About a decade ago, a couple of... Um, graduate, third, I guess third year is the last year of law school, right? So a couple of law students come into my office and they said, we're almost to the end of our law program and we don't want to be lawyers. And I said, why are you telling me? Well, you're going through an existential crisis. Go talk to the law school dean about what you've done. They said, no, we'd like to go into investing. Can you make some suggestions on how we can get there? I said, you have a long hill to climb because you've spent three years not looking at numbers at law school. Now you've got to look at numbers. Why put yourself at a disadvantage? Why not start a new business? And your business will be that you focus only on companies that have been targeted in lawsuits. And in the US, that's a lot of companies. 
And your only skill set is you're not do, going to do growth rates, cash flows, let other people do it. Your only focus is going to be on looking at the lawsuits, estimating the likelihood that you will lose the lawsuits and the payout. Because that's a special skill. Markets have no idea how to deal with lawsuits. That's why if you see a company like Merck when it was in the Vioxx lawsuits, they lost the lawsuit, the stock price would lose $3 billion. When the lawsuit would jump $5 billion, markets were like, you know, swinging all over the place because nobody has any idea what to do with this. So think about that when you think about the value of equities. This is your last chance. Look around. Look at all the potential things you might have to pay out. Take care of them. And only then should you assess a value for equity for the company. Let's talk a little bit about equity options. I already, I mean, how, if, if any of you end up going, any of you going to the Silicon Valley to work for a startup or not even your own startup, but somebody else's startup? Nobody? Okay. No, really? So everybody's going to go work for an investment bank? What it is? No. Or whatever it is. The, pro, the reason I ask that question is if you have a startup coming on and offering you a job, clearly they can't pay you what Goldman does. Why? They don't have the cash. So odds are you're going to be offered options in the company, not because they like you or want you, but this is the only way they can compete. You know why I bring that up? It's basically I'm saying equity options are just employee compensation. That's what it is. There's nothing more, nothing less to them. And the reason companies use them is because they don't have the cash to pay conventional compensation. And once you say that, it kind of opens up the process. Because what do we do with the rest of compensation expenses? It goes into cost of goods sold. We subtract it out to get to operating income. Yeah? Yeah, that's, why, that's the point I'm making. It's an expense. It goes into cost of goods sold, just like paying cash. So in fact, I'm reinforcing that case, that just because you pay with stock doesn't make it any less of an expense. It has to be treated as an employee expense. See, isn't it already? It is now. But for a long period in the US, if you granted employee options, they were often treated as worth nothing, basically free, because they were at the money options. And that's, that's one of the things we're going we're gonna to talk about, is if you give away options that are at the money, can you treat them as free currency? And of course, after taking finance class or even looking at the options market, the answer is of course not. But for a long time in US accounting, that's what you were allowed to do is treat them essentially as free currency. So what we're going to talk about is essentially why options affect your value as an equity investor. Okay. When you think about options, the options, even if they're granted at the money, basically affect your equity value because when somebody exercises the option, they're exercising it at a price below the current stock price. It's a given. That's why they exercise it. So what you're bringing in is that factor into evaluation is today the option might be at the money, but who knows what will be two years or five years from now. Right? So when you look at what happens when the options are exercised, there are two ways a company can deal with option exercises. One is some companies buy back stock in the market to cover option exercises. Microsoft did this for 20 years. As equity investors, how does it affect you? Let's say you're conventional equity investors. If a company buys back equity, what is it doing? It's taking cash flows that could have come to you and used it to buy back. So it reduces the cash flow that would be available to you as an equity investor because they have to buy back the shares in the market and set it aside to cover option exercises. Yeah. So that's the first way. Right. Not at the magnitude we're talking about. We're talking about these are not big buybacks. These are buybacks just to cover option exercises, and many tech companies used to do it, but essentially drains cash flows that could have come to you. The other is not buy back stock, and when the options get exercised, issue new shares. And that affects you because now those new shares are being issued at a price below the current. Either way, you're going to be hurt as an equity investor. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do. You might want these employees as equity investors in the company, but I'm saying when options get granted, you're paying for them as equity investors. So what I'm going to do is take a very simple example so you can see this play out. Let's say you have a firm. Hey, the firm has $100 million in free cash flows. It's growing 3% a year forever, and the cost of capital is 8%. The company has 100 million shares outstanding and a billion dollars in debt. So let's value the firm. $100 million is the cash flow divided by cost of capital minus growth rate. I come up with $2 billion. 
I subtract out the data per billion. I come up with the value of equity. Divide by the number of shares. Value per share. This is so simple. We nailed this a few weeks ago. You're right. So value per share is $10 per share. So here's where I'm going to introduce the options. Let's say this company now grants 10 million options with a strike price of $10. You see why I picked the $10? The value per share is 10. They're issuing the shares at the stock price. It's an at-the-money option. You're the equity investors in the company. You pay $10 per share for this company before I told you this new thing. My question is, think purely in terms of how much you're willing to pay per share now. Are you going to continue to pay $10 per share? Are you going to pay more than $10 per share? Or so there's the three choices, pretty much cover the spectrum, right? $10 per share, more than Let's take the one that should not even be on the table out of the process. Will any of you be willing to pay more than $10 per share? If you are, I'd like you to be investors in my startup, <laughs> because clearly you're going in the wrong direction. So, so the choices are 10 or below 10. And a lot of people seem to be saying below 10. So where is the lost value? If I'm giving away the option, they're at the money. Why are you so upset? What's the big deal? Have you ever tried to buy? Yeah, go ahead. Let's say I'm not, I've made, yeah. But let's say I've done nothing yet. Right now, I've issued at the stock price. So, I've, so I'm playing devil's advocate. There's no, it's an at the money option. I'm not going to buy any of your shares. There's no cash flow effect. It's still going to be the 100 million. So right now, you're saying, hey, not a big deal. 10,000, you divided by 110 now? Well, the 10 million shares, if they get issued, right, if, if you exercise the option right now, what's going to happen? $10 per share has to be paid to you, right? So if you decide to act like you have immediate exercise, what's going to happen is you're going to get 100 million as cash flow. You add that to a billion, you're going to get 1.1 billion. You divide by 110, you're actually ending up. That's called the, ex the treasury stock approach. We're going to come back and talk about this. In the treasury stock approach, what you do is you take your value of the firm, you add on the exercise proceeds as if they get exercised today. So if you follow that route, you're actually going to end up with a value. You're going to say, I'm not affected. You know why you should be affected, though? Open up the options page in the Wall Street Journal. Find an option that's at the money today. It's only even a three-month option. Okay, so let's say IBM is at 90, 90 and the strike price is 90. Call your broker and ask him whether you can get that option for free. Try it. I mean, it's a, maybe you have a really stupid broker. He says, no problem. It's at the money. You, know, you can take it as many as you want. What you're going to find is a price of $6.23, right? Or $5.45. And that's for a three-month option. Do you see where I'm going? Even though these options are at the money, there is value to the options because there's a time premium. And guess who pays for the time premium? You do. That's why your value per share goes down. And that's why you have to bring in the optionality to make the argument. If you talk in terms of exercise value, you say, hey, there's no effect. I can issue as many options as I want. And that's what made pre-2007 US accounting so deadly. Because pre-2007, that's how you accounted for options. If you granted options at the money, they were treated as free when you were granted them. So it's 100 times nothing? Nothing. 100 million times nothing is nothing. A billion times nothing? You see where I'm going? Boards of directors would grant out hundreds of millions of options to CEOs saying, hey, we're giving away a free thing. What does it matter if I give 100 million of the free thing or a billion of the free thing? And the next thing you would find out, you'd wake up and 35% of your company would have ended up in the hands of the top management. So let's talk about the ways to deal with this. And we'll look at three different ways in which we can deal with options. One is actually called the dilution approach, where all you worry about is the number of shares. And we'll talk about why that's always going to give you too low a value. Then you've got the treasury stock approach, where you act like everything gets exercised today. And that's going to give you too high a value. And this is like Goldilocks. There must be a third approach where you get exactly the right value. So let's start with the first one. You keep the billion as is. You change the number of units. You use fully diluted shares. A lot of equity research analysts, this is the way they deal with options is they even forget about options, they get to the very end of the process and then divide by the total number. So what you're going to do is divide a billion by 110 million shares, you get $9.09 .09 per share. Why are you undervaluing the shares? Because you're not counting in the cash that comes in. 
when these options get exercised. So when you use the fully diluted approach, I can almost guarantee you're going to come up with too low a value for your company because you're counting all the bad stuff. Okay? And there are variants in this approach where you count only the shares which are in the money. They'll be doing these dances. But it's still an approach that misses the point about options. So that's a fully diluted approach. Just count the number of shares. Any questions on that one? Here's the second one. It's a little more refined. You come up with the value of the firm. You add, subtract the debt. You get a value for the equity. But you also add in the proceeds from the, you act like they're exercised today. That's basically what you're doing. You take 10 times 10. So that will lead you to believe that nothing should happen to your shares because you're acting like they get exercised today. What are you missing with this approach? You're missing the time premium of the options. That's basically it. The treasury stock approach, which is the preferred approach by, for many DCF valuations, misses the time premium in options. And that's going to be huge. You know why? Because most employee options are three month, five month, six month, 10 year, five year. They're going to be really long term, right? And do safe companies issue a lot of options, or is it mostly the risky companies? So basically, you have safe or risky. It's usually young, risky companies. So basically, of long term options issued by young, risky companies, think of what the premium is going to look like. Right? It's going to be huge, and you're ignoring it. So with the treasury stock approach, you're going to overvalue companies because you're missing the time premium on the options. So the full dilution approach, you undervalue companies. The treasury stock approach, you overvalue companies. So what's the right thing to do? What are we missing? The time premium, right? Is there a way we can estimate the time premium on an option? Come on, you're in the second year of an MBA program. Presumably, the 150000 you've already spent, sunk cost, has paid off a little bit. You've seen the black shoals. You might not have used it. You've seen the binomial. You've forgotten it. But you know there are these models out there, option pricing models. And what do they do? They allow you to estimate the premium based on observables on the option, the strike price, the stock price. That's exactly what we're going to do, is we're going to value the options as options, which is what they should have been in the first place, not as exercise today or number of shares. And we're going to subtract the value of the options from the equity value that you got. Effectively, you see what I'm doing? You're the equity investors in the company. I'm saying, by giving these options, you've, sub you've given away a portion of the equity. I'm going to subtract out the value of the options. And once I subtract out the value of the options, I've taken care of employee stock options. I can then go back to the original 100 shares or 100 million shares I had. I don't have to worry about dilution, partial dilution. It's already incorporated by subtracting out the value of the options. So I have to use an option pricing model. And here's one of the problems we faced with employee options. Conventional option pricing models were designed to value short-term options on traded stocks. So they're designed for the listed options, the CBOE. Employee options are really long-term. You're saying, so what traditional option pricing models assume constant variance over the life of the option. Not a big deal if you have a three-month option. But with a 10-year option in a young growth company, you can already see much more dangerous assumption. And third, with traditional options, let's say you buy an option on Tesla, a call option. You're doing it because you think the stock will go up. So let's say the stock is at 220, you buy a 250 call option. Stock goes to 275. You're celebrating, right? Now there are two things you can do. You have three months left on the option. But you can exercise right now, in which case you can make 275 minus 250, which is $25. But with a listed option, you almost never should exercise, right? What's a better choice? Sell the option for 25 plus the time premium. And you're able to do that because it's a listed option, listed stock. You see the problem with employee options? Let's say you come to work for me on Twitter. You really don't want to because you think I'm a disaster waiting to happen. But you take it because I give you call options on Twitter at a, at, at a $30 price. You come in, and single-handedly, you push the price up to 50 You are the Twitter guy. But you think 50 is too high. You think the market's overreacted to you. So what do you want to do? You want to sell your employee option, but the problem with employee options is there's no market out there. 
So what's your only choice then? If you're an employee, you have options in a tech company, the stock price has shot up, you're worried it's shot up too much, you have to exercise. So employee options often will get exercised well before expiration because you don't have liquidity. Cisco actually tried to create a market for its employee options. The SEC said, no, you can't do it. And they did it precisely for this reason. So when you take option pricing models and you try to value employee options using the life of the option, and you're going to overvalue employee options because you're acting like they're going to stay live for the next 10 years, when in fact, they're often going to get exercised, and at least the research seems to be just about halfway to their end life. But let me try this. I have the parameters for my option, right? The S is 10, the K is 10, because I issued it at the money. There's 10 years, it's a 10 year option. Let's assume the standard deviation of stock price is about 40%. I'm a very risky company, and the riskless rate is 4%. I'm not going to force the black shoals down your throat, but if I plug these numbers into an option pricing model, the value that I get for the option is 542, and I do make a couple of adjustments when I use Black Scholes option pricing model to value employee options. The first is I adjust the life of the option if need be, saying, you know, 10 years, you know, they're probably more like five year options. The other is I have to factor in something else that happens in employee options. When I buy a call option in IBM, the CBOE, and I exercise the option, it's a side bet between me and somebody else, right? The number of shares in IBM doesn't change because I exercise the option. When employee options get exercised, we talked about this, what happens, a company either has to buy the shares and set them aside, or issue new shares, there's a dilution effect. And that's gonna be a problem, and here's why. If you thought your options were at the money today, you're sadly mistaken, because if you try to exercise the options today, what's gonna to happen? The number of shares is gonna jump, and as the number of shares jumps, you might actually end up with a lower value for the equity. That's a dilution effect. So when I value these options, what I have to factor in is when this, these options get exercised, you're actually going to affect the stock price. Especially if you have a lot of options. A CEO with 25 million options in a company with 100 million options exercises all those options, you can almost guarantee there's going to be a drop in the stock price. So the two adjustments I make in the option pricing model is I actually adjust the stock price for the potential dilution. It's not difficult to do. You have to figure out how many options there are versus the number of shares. And I also adjust the life of the option for the fact that employee options get exercised earlier. The value that I get is $5.42 per option. How many options did I give the, the top manager? I gave him 10 million options that are at the money, right? If I trust my option pricing model, I've effectively paid him 10 times $5.42, which is $54.2 million of my equity. I'm almost home. So here's what I do. I take the 1,000 value for equity I had before. I subtract the $54.2 million that I've given away to the top management. I come up with $945.8 million. Divide that by the 100 million shares outstanding. The value per share that I get is $9.46. That's why you as a stockholder can't sit by and watch a company grant options like crazy and not do anything about it because it's affecting your value per share. Square, the Square IPO has been put on the table, right? I haven't seen the prospectus, but I can almost guarantee you that if you look at the prospectus, it'll tell you the number of shares, but keep reading. In the prospectus, it'll also tell you the options that the company has already granted. And with a company like that, you can almost guarantee that the options are gonna be a lot of options. You have to factor in those options when you value the IPO. Just as I had to, when I did the Facebook IPO, the Twitter IPO, those options have to be brought in. Yes, Chad. Well, you can set aside an option pool, but when you go public, remember, it's almost like you're starting from scratch. An investor getting into the company is not bound by any of the, those agreements are more to protect VCs. Once you go public, all those protections blow up. And that's part of the problem is, when you have three players in a game, you can have these independent contracts you make with each other to protect yourself from future capital dilution. But once you go public, I'm completely exposed as an investor in Square. So once you get there, you've got to go back to this practice and say, these are the options outstanding. This is how much it drains on my value. My value per share for this company is X dollars because of the options. So the bigger your option overhang, 
the less value per share I will attach to your company. So be careful about the options you grant key employees along the way to keep them in your company because they will come back to haunt you, especially if you're successful. If you're not successful, nobody cares. The options are worth nothing anyway. But if you're successful, they're going to be a big drag on your value when you go public. Yes? Is that why companies try to buy them back? Yeah, they, you can, and also remember companies have other protections they put in, right? Most employee options come with vesting periods. What does that mean? You join Square, they'll give you options, but you really don't actually have those options until you work there two years or three years. So many tech companies, one of the advantages they face is there's so much turnover. and People move from company to company that if you look at the actual options that get to the point of vesting, Especially early in its life, it might be only 50% of the options you grant. It's only as you get more valuable that, com that employees end up becoming attached to your company because they know that if you're a Facebook employee and in six months you're going to get $50 million in options, you're not leaving to go anywhere. I don't care how great a job I offer you. So that's when you start to get the stickiness in the number of options. Any other questions on options? So that's how you take into account options. So this takes care of options that have already been granted, right? So if you tell me how many, and every US company now, if you look at the footnotes, has to give you this table. And usually the table will give you the number of options outstanding. It'll actually tell you how many are vested. It'll give you an average strike price. An av It'll give you all the information you need to value the options. Use it. In fact, many of them try to help you out by also giving you a standard deviation of the stock price. Don't trust them. Just do it yourself. Why should that guy come and tell you my standard deviation is 32%? When you know the industry average, you can see their own stock prices. But that's, that's the table used to value options. I call this the dead weight cost of past option grants. There's one thing, though, there's a little tweak there that you have to think about. When these options get exercised, you get a tax saving. The case of Facebook, this was a big deal because at the time of the IPO, I think $5 billion worth of options got exercised, which created a huge tax deduction for Facebook. And of course, you had politicians jumping up and down saying, this is horrible, this is terrible. But the thing is that $5 billion now showed up as income to Mark Zuckerberg, who paid taxes on that income. So the tax guy collects anyway, but he wants to collect everywhere. So what I'm trying to say is that 54.2 million that I estimated the value of the options, if you get a tax saving on it, is really going to be only 35. So in my Excel spreadsheet, that's what you see as the option worksheet. I compute the value of your options, and I multiply by 1 minus the tax rate to capture the fact that you get a tax benefit. If you don't like it, just go out and take out the 1 minus T. It'll still work. It'll just put the entire 54.2 million. So that effectively takes care of options already granted. As I said, under 2007, US accounting was completely screwed up. And because it was screwed up, every company that could give options, and even some that could not, gave options. 2007, after I think seven years of back and forth and feedback, they finally made the change. I still remember I was in a panel at Goldman Sachs in 2007 when this change was imminent, and with three tech CEOs. And they said, if this change goes through, we'll have to shut down. And my response was, if that is all that's standing between you and shutting down, is my treating your employee expenses the way they should be treated, you should shut down. That's absurd. When you say, look, you know, if, so, it, so after 2007, the accounting change came. The, word, the sky didn't fall in. But one thing did change. A lot of companies stopped giving employee options. They continue to give employees compensation, stock-based compensation, but they've shifted away from options to restricted stock. What's restricted stock? Microsoft gives it, and IBM gives it. I give you shares in the company. That's the stock part. What's a restriction? You can't sell the shares for three years or five years. So that's what makes them restricted. From a valuation perspective, that makes me happy. It's much easier to do with restricted stock than options. They're like any other shares. They're like voting and non-voting shares, liquid and non-liquid shares. So they've shifted to restricted. So tax laws have, in this case, the accounting laws had consequences. The only problem is the tax law is still based on the pre-2007 accounting rules. The tax law, still, you get the deduction when options get exercised. Not, so you actually have two sets of rules now. The accounting rules, you have to show the option expense. 
the year you grant them using an option pricing model. The tax laws are still stuck in pre don't ask me why, but you have two sets of rules, and that creates a bit of an issue, a timing issue at least in valuation as to when you pay those taxes. But here's the other, the other half of the equation. This takes care of options you've already granted, right? But what if I expect you to keep granting options in the future? How do you bring those in? You see what I'm talking about? You take a couple like Cisco. It's granted options every year for the last 20 years. It's going to continue to keep granting them. By valuing the options and bringing them in, I've taken into account the options they've already given out, but I haven't taken into account the options I expect them to give out in the future. You know the way to break through there, though? Remember what we started this discussion? What do we say option expenses? They're employee expenses, right? If you treat them as employee expenses, we said you should be treating them as part of cost of goods sold coming up with operating income. So if I expect you to keep granting options in the future, you know what I should do? I should have a line item. Maybe you can even keep it separate for option expenses as a percentage of revenues. And that's why if I valued Cisco, that's what I would do going into the future, 1% of revenue set aside every year. I'm going to treat it like any other expense, and my earnings every year will then be after that option expense, which means I'm going to put a double whammy on my valuation in Cisco. The first whammy will come about when I value existing options. That lowers the value of my equity. The second whammy will come about because I have future option grants, which will lower future earnings, future cash flows. Don't think of it as double counting. They're two separate issues. Many companies now that have switched to restricted stock have option deadweight costs from past option issues, but they no longer have a future option problem because they no longer grant options. So separate the two because they both affect your value of equity and you have to bring both into play. So if you think about why options affect value, the types of companies that grant options are exactly the kind of companies where options have big premiums. They're young, risky companies. Your options are long term. There is no way around this. You have to deal with options as options. There are no excuses left. You can't say, well, the option pricing models don't work that well. After eight years of using these in employee options, it's, it's amazing how, how good the option pricing models have become. You know, I would like to see the Cisco model played out. I think it's a good idea to allow employees to sell and buy options, to have a market, even within Cisco. right? Because I think it does create liquidity and options that right now is lacking. But I think we need to be sensible about the way we think about options. Any questions on options? So now what I'd like to do is go back to that very first session when I said, are you a storyteller or a number cruncher? Remember that question? And some of you have already decided. And I said valuation is a bridge between the two. So as you sit down to value a company, I want you to go through this process. Start with a story for your company and connect the story to the numbers. So I'll, I'm going to take you through a process. Because right now you think, what does that even mean? I'm going to take you through the process of going from a story to number. And I'm going to use Uber as my example to illustrate it, because it's a company I've kind of wrestled with for the last year and a half. So when I first I'll make a confession, June of 2014, when I read that news story about Uber being priced at $17 billion by a VC round, I knew nothing about the company. Partly because I never take cabs, I live in the subway. To me, being on the surface in New York City is a huge waste of time. So as somebody who never takes car services, I never used Uber. In fact, the only way I knew there was an Uber was every month in my credit card, there were like five Uber charges because my son had managed to put my credit card in to the Uber account. I had no idea what Uber was. You know. I thought maybe he was taking German classes, and I said, where's the umlaut on the Uber? Yeah. So I said, you know what? I, I was curious. That's the only reason I picked it up. I, I didn't start off saying, these VCs must be wrong, therefore I have to prove them. Well, what do I care? It's not my skin in the game anyway. So I said, I need to value Uber, but to value Uber, I need to find out what the company does. So here's the first thing I did. I put the Uber app on my phone, step one. I hit the Uber app. I called an Uber driver, even though I had no place to go. He showed up, and he said, where do you want to go? I said, I'd like to drive around for about 45 minutes and ask you some questions. He thought I was really weird. I said, no, 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 don't worry. I just want to find out what you do, why you do what you do. So as I drove around, he said, no, how do you connect with Uber? How does this work? And he explained to me that. Uber allows him to get customers, and that for every $10 or $100 he gets in tax receipts, 
20% goes to Uber, and I, and I said, why 2080? And he said, that's what it is. I have no idea. You know? So I kind of got a sense of why these drivers. So basically, he was doing it as a second job. And he was using his excess capacity in his car to kind of make some extra money. So I could see why drivers did it. It allowed them to get customers that they otherwise would not have got. But then I had the other half of the equation. Why do people like Uber? So I first asked my son, hey, Brendan, why do you like Uber? And he said, Dad, on Fridays and Saturdays, I don't want to drive. I kind of read the subtext there. <laughs> it's nice to have Uber because I can get back home safely. But in a sense, you could see that for customers, it was convenient. It was an app. It was an extension of the way we think about things. It's not like going the, the street. I mean, that's kind of primitive. It's in, so I could see. So the first step for me for valuing Uber was to get a sense of what it did. And then I told my first story of Uber. In my initial valuation of Uber, I described it as an urban car service company. Every word here is going to be significant in my valuation. An urban car service company that is going to moderately increase the size of the car service market by attracting people like my son, who otherwise would not have used a car service, with local networking benefits. As I said, I'll come back and explain what that even means. And significant competitive advantages. And that's going to be my initial story. An urban car service company with local networking benefits and significant competitive advantages. And I did assume that their existing business model would continue. What's their existing business model? They don't own the cars. The drivers are independent contractors. They don't even have offices in most of the cities. They have little guys hanging out in a hotel room in most cities that they operate in. Very minimalist investment. And all of that is going to show up in my valuation. Urban car service company, local networking benefits, significant competitive advantages, minimalist capital requirements. After I told the story, I had to stop and ask, is this story going to pass the test? And here's my test. I call it the 3P test. The first is, is this story possible? Yeah, of course, that's such a weak test. Though some, I've seen valuations are based on impossible stories. What's an impossible story? A story you tell me of how your company ends up with 120% market share. That's the problem, 120, that's it. Another, so if your story is impossible, go back to the drawing board, right? So if I gave you a story for Ferrari where they're selling 5 million cars at 2 million apiece, that is an impossible story. Is it possible? Yes. Is it plausible? A little stronger test, right? Because now I'm saying, and at least when I did my initial valuation, I said the car service business is clearly plausible because they've succeeded. And maybe some of the other things they're trying are plausible. But this notion of Uber replacing your second car, I don't think is plausible yet. In June of 2014, I kind of stopped there. And is it probable? Clearly, already they had a foothold in the car service business. So the possible, plausible, and probable test is to make sure your narrative, you're not telling fairy tales. This is your last chance. Say, hey, I'm not telling a fairy tale. This story could actually fly. So in the case of Ferrari, I gave you two plausible stories for Ferrari. The status quo story, where they continue to sell 8,000, 9,000 cars, keep their price premiums up, and come up with a value. And another plausible story is that they increase production, but in the process they have to sell and spend more in advertising. They're both plausible stories. Um, less plausible stories, they double the sales, and they're able to keep the margins up and not sell on selling because some piece is not connected. Possible, plausible, probable. So I got my story, I tested it, I said, look, I feel pretty comfortable with the story. What's the next step? I have to convert the story into numbers in my valuation. And here's where every piece of the story is going to come in. Remember I called them an urban car service company? When I tell a market story of what my market is, that sets a total market in my valuation. That's what I'm targeting towards. So if you're an entrepreneur, that's what you want, right? You want big market stories because you get a big starting number. I talked about networking benefits. And I said local networking benefits. Let me explain. What's, what's the essence of a networking benefit? Technology companies often talk about this. Usually, as in most businesses, as you get bigger, it gets more difficult to keep getting bigger, right? Your easy customers come first. But in technology, there is actually this tipping point where as you get bigger, it actually gets easier to get bigger because, like eBay in the auction market, Microsoft in Office. Google as a search engine. Why? Because once you get big enough, 
Everybody wants to be with you rather than with somebody else. So there's a tipping point, and the way this plays out is you could end up with a 55, 60, 65 percent market share in those markets because you have global network, because you have networking benefits. With Uber, are there networking benefits? How does it show up? When you hit the Uber app, it tells you whether there's a car, right? And how far it is from you. So if you become the largest car service company in a city, the way it shows up is there's an Uber car closer to you most of the time than a Lyft car, which means that once you get to be the biggest player in a city, then it becomes easier to become even bigger rather than because the drivers want to drive for you, the customers come towards you. But in my story, I said it had local networking benefits, which means if it became the biggest player in LA, it helped it in LA, but if you land in Jakarta airport and you wanted to get to your hotel, you didn't look at the largest market share company on the globe, you looked to see who had the most cars. So at least in my story, the, the networking benefits would be local, which means that they would win in 50 cities, somebody else would win in Shanghai, somebody else would win in Jakarta, somebody else in Mumbai, which meant that the market share I would give them would have to be much smaller than if I gave them global net. That's in my story. I gave them significant competitive advantages. Where, the, where does it show up? It shows up in that 2080 split. Remember, I asked the driver, why 2080? Why not 1585, 1090? If you have strong competitive advantages, you can preserve that 80 20 split. And you can also keep your other costs low because it's much tougher for new players to enter the market. So that's going to show up in the margin. And the capital investment argument that I made, that this is a low capital intensity business, also means that they can scale up at relatively little cost, that they can get big increases in revenues with relatively little investment because they're not buying the cars, they're not hiring the drivers, they're not investing in infrastructure. Do You see where I'm going? When you look at my valuation, you're going to see my story play out in the numbers. And here's how you're going to see it play out. The market that I used for Uber was the global taxi, urban taxi market of 100 billion. Because I made an urban car service company, that defines my market. The market share I gave them as my end game was a 10% market share, not a 50% market share because I gave them local networking benefits. The margins that I gave them were 30% because I had strong competitive advantages. And the amount they have to reinvest is relatively small. I gave them a high sales to capital ratio because I'm assuming that they can keep doing what they're doing now, not buying cars, not investing in infrastructure. So if I showed you that valuation, every number there, and say, why is that number there? My answer should be to go back to the story and say, this is my story, and this is what's driving the number. The $6 billion value that I got for Uber reflected my story for Uber as an urban car service company. So I posted this in June of 2014 on both my blog, and it showed up in 538, the Nate Silver site that's now owned by ESPN. And it got picked up in Silicon Valley, and I get a wave of hate mail saying, you know, how dare you value a young tech company that's really for us. You know, you're just a DCF guy. The way they say DCF is actually kind of, you know, the, the, the contempt oozes out of it, the D and the C and the F, the DCF guy. Right? But I remember I was sitting in, a, in an airport in Munich, and I get an email from... Bill Gurley, who was one of the lead VCs in Uber. And he said, I've just posted something on my blog, and I wanted to give you a heads up that it's not very kind to you. And I said, OK, thank you for letting me know. And the first thing I do, of course, is I go check his blog. And here's the headline, the modern misses by a mile. Get into Uber, driving, misses. And essentially, he, took, you know, he told me a narrative that was very different from mine. And I was fascinated. Because let's face it, does Bill Gurley know more about the company than I do? Hands down. The only thing I know about the company is what I read from rumors in Business Insider, which is like reading the Daily Mirror. You have no idea what's true, what's false, what's just sales pitch. Okay? So I said, you know what? It's fascinating. Because here's the narrative he said. He, he said, Uber is really not an urban car service company. It's a logistics company. You see how words matter? What's the essence of logistics? Anytime you have to move an item, a person from point A. So he said, we're not just in car service. We're going to be in moving. We're going to be in delivering. How does it change? It changes the total market. And so being a 100 billion market, now you're talking about a 300 billion dollar market. He said, we're not going to have local network. We're going to have global networking benefits. And the story he told us about connecting to credit cards. And when you land in Jakarta, 
Remember, when you hit that app, your credit card is in there. He said, you're not going to trust the local car service company if it's Grab Taxi. So we're going to find a way to connect you to us. It's going to give us global news. So what does that change? So with 10% market share, you're talking about a 40% market share, right? He didn't use any of the numbers. He just told the story. I was just connecting the numbers as I was reading the story. He, the rest of the story, he said, I kind of agree with you. We're going to maintain the look. So after I read his post, I actually emailed him and said, would you like me to value your story for you? He said, what? What are you talking about? He said, you've told a nice story. I can actually convert into a DCF, much as you might have known. Okay. So I, and so I put in the 300 billion market, sh market in the 40% market share, and I came up with a $53 billion value for Uber. And I sent it back. I said, that's your value for Uber. And then he wrote back and said, oh, I forgot to tell you, I think that 80-20 split is going to kind of get under pressure. I said, not a problem. I'll make it 90-10. I'll send you back a valuation two days later. I sent him back a $29 billion value. You tell me a story. I can attach a number to the story. When you don't like my valuation of Uber, it's not the problem with the DCF. It's a problem because my imagination might not be as creative. Maybe I'm missing some part of the story. And that was the emphasis I was trying to make. So you've got the story. You've got the feedback. Be ready to change. Why? Because things change around you. Your story can, and that's why my most recent Uber valuation, if you've seen it, is $23 billion. Have we learned a lot about Uber? Have there been a lot of news stories about Uber in the last? Have there been a day in the last year and three months where there hasn't been a news story about Uber? So I took everything and I brought it in. So be ready to change your story, even over the course of the three months that you're here, because who knows what can happen in three months. Narratives can break, they can change, they can shift. And your job is to adjust your valuation accordingly. So when we start off on Monday, we will start.